So what we're going to be talking about today is general RLC circuits. So for a parallel RLC circuit, where we might have something like this, VS R1, R, L, and C. Let's, yes, always a DC source for, um, for these specifically. So for a circuit like this, where during the transient condition, it should be obvious there is just a resistor in parallel with an inductor in parallel with a capacitor. Um, let's call this IR, IL, and IC. Applying Kirchhoff's current law at the top node yields IR plus IL plus IC is equal to zero. Expressing everything in terms of our voltage um, would be V of T over R plus, let's see. one over L times the integral from T naught to T of V of T prime DT plus I L at T naught plus C DV by DT equal to zero and I am going to take the derivative of both sides leaving me with the second derivative of voltage with respect to time squared plus let's see when I take the derivative so that's going to be one over RC times the derivative of the voltage squared plus one over LC times the voltage term itself is equal to zero. Okay, so this, uh, the, the, the more formal derivation where I talk more or whatever was on that video that I asked you guys to watch while I was out for that. Um, so what is interesting about this second order differential equation, which you guys may not have been aware of, is let's call this coefficient right here B, and let's call this coefficient right here C. Well, we found that alpha was 1 over twice RC for a parallel RLC circuit, which is exactly that coefficient B divided by a factor of two. And we found that omega naught was the square root of one over LC, which is exactly the square root of that coefficient C. So now let's look at a series RLC circuit. 
here's R, here's L. Is there a question? To get from this to this. Yes, I just took the derivative of both sides with respect to sides. All right, so looking at our series RLC circuit, where I'm going to call this current I of T. So this is my voltage DL, DC, and VR of T. We could say that VR plus DL plus VC is equal to zero, and we can express all three of those voltage drops as a function of our current I. So that would be R times I of T plus L di by dt plus one over c integral from d naught to t of i of t prime dt prime plus vc of t naught is equal to zero taking the derivative of both sides and doing a little bit of rearranging is going to give me the second derivative of the current squared plus r over l times the first derivative of the current plus one over lc times equal to zero. Again, let's call the coefficient on the first derivative term B and the coefficient on the zeroth derivative term C. And for a series RLC circuit, we found that alpha was R over twice L, which is exactly one half of B. And we know that omega naught is equal to one over the square root of LC, excuse me, uh, square root of one over LC, which is exactly the square root of coefficient C. So in both cases, the Nepper frequency was simply one half of the coefficient that's acting on the first derivative term. And the resonant frequency omega naught was exactly square root of the coefficient on the zero derivative term. So I would argue correctly that if we can write a second order differential equation where the coefficient for the, uh, the second derivative term is one for any RLC circuit, then we know that the Nepper frequency is just going to be the coefficient of the first derivative term multiplied by a factor of one half, and the resonant frequency will be the coefficient of the zeroth derivative term when we take the square root. Okay. So what we're going to do from here on out is just look at a circuit. If it falls simply into the bucket of series RLC circuits, then we can use our series RLC rules. If it falls into the parallel RLC circuit constraint, we can use our parallel RLC circuit rules. And if it doesn't fall into either of those, then it is a general RLC circuit where we have to determine the second order differential equation in order to determine alpha and omega naught. So it's not going to be just a general, it's this all the time. Anymore. So with that in mind, <clears throat> 
let's take a look at the following circuit. And let's say that we have a switch like so, where it was closed at position A for a long time before closing at position B at T is equal to zero. So this circuit is an example of a general RLC circuit. Um, and I can say that because while the capacitor C is in parallel with resistor R2 during the transient condition, these are not in parallel with L, right? And while R3 is in series with L, the capacitor isn't in series with those two elements because it's in parallel with R2. So this circuit does not fall neatly into the bin of series RLC circuits or parallel RLC circuits. And therefore we are gonna to have to approach it as a general RLC circuit, okay? So our goal here is to get a second order differential equation in either terms of our capacitor voltage or our inductor current, okay? It doesn't matter which one we get, alpha and omega naught will wind up being the exact same thing. So I am going to label a few quantities here. So I'm gonna call this guy BC, the voltage drop across my capacitor. And I'm gonna call this guy I see representing the current flowing through my capacitor. Similarly, the voltage drop across my inductor will be VL and the current flowing through my inductor will be IL. And to reiterate, our goal is to get a second order differential equation expressed as a function of only our capacitor voltage or only our inductor current. So if we can get in terms of one of those two quantities, we're good to go. So <clears throat> let's talk about our approach because all of these circuits will be inherently different we can't really have a generalized approach that will work for every possible circuit, okay? Um, what I tend to do is to fall back on my Kirchhoff's current law relationships and my Kirchhoff's voltage law relationships. Uh, that's not to say that you can't perform nodal analysis on something like this or mesh analysis on something like this, but I personally find that the math is a little bit easier on me and how my brain works by applying KCL and KVL based relationships. So let's do that. Um, our goal here is to determine the second order differential equation during the transient condition. So during the transient condition would mean that this switch is closed. And so R2 is in parallel with C, is in parallel with the series combination of R3 and L. 
right? Okay. So I am going to apply Kirchhoff's parent law at this top node here next to R3. So just for the sake of argument, let's call it node X. Let's talk about what KCL at X is going to be during the transient condition. All right. No. So the reason why I say that, so zero minus, uh, what's going on at zero minus, zero plus, and all that kind of stuff doesn't have any bearing whatsoever on whether the circuit is overdamped, underdamped, or critically damped. We are trying to solve for alpha and omega naught, and we'll worry about all that other stuff later. We're effectively approaching this problem in the exact same order that we approached all the others, figuring out what kind of response to expect before going through our analysis at zero minus, zero plus, and infinity. That step, that initial step of determining, you know, what alpha and omega naught is, involves us figuring out how this thing behaves and developing that second order differential equation. All right, so KCL at node X is going to be adding this current, this current, and this current together, setting them equal to zero. Does that make sense? Let's start there. So during the transient condition with the switch closed at position B, there is a possibility of some resistor current because it's no longer open circuited. Uh, there's a current that's potentially flowing through the capacitor and there's a potential uh, current that's potentially flowing through the inductor. So that makes sense to me. All right, so how are we going to express the current flowing through resistor R2 in terms of the capacitor voltage or the inductor current? Okay, so the voltage drop over R2 is the same as the capacitor voltage. I 100% agree with that. So follow that thought through and apply Ohm's law to tell me what the current through the resistor is. VC over R2. All right. So VC over R2 represents the current flowing down through resistor R2. Are we all okay with that? I don't particularly, I'm never going to use VX at all. I'm just trying to explain what node I'm applying KCL on. All right. The current flowing down through the capacitor, we could write as IC of T. And the current flowing to the right through the resistor R3. is simply I L of T. So this equation is pretty good, but it's not good enough. And what I mean by that is, since I want everything in terms of just VC or just I L, this capacitor current term needs to be in terms of those quantities as well. Well, luckily for us, there is a very simple relationship that relates the current flowing through a capacitor to the voltage drop over a capacitor. I is equal to C dV by dt. So we can take this one step further. We have VC over T divided by, or excuse me, VC of T divided by R2 plus C dvc by dt plus il of t is equal to zero. This is equation one, and it is, in my opinion, a good equation because it is expressed only in terms of our capacitor voltage and our inductor current 
And another reason that it's a good equation is I could simply move this quantity IL of T to the other side of my equal sign. And I would know, I would then have an expression for IL of T only in terms of my other variables if I needed it, okay? We're gonna wind up having to do substitution and things like that. And so an equation of this form where we could say, the inductor current is related to the capacitor voltage by this relationship is a good thing and vice versa if we had an equation where we only had the capacitor voltage and then inductor current stuff on the other side would also be a good equation for substitution purposes okay so i'm going to call this guy equation one so this is the result of applying kirchhoff's current law at node x now i am going to apply kirchhoff's voltage law around the right hand loop. So what I mean by that is the voltage drop between here and here is VC or it's the voltage drop over R3 plus the voltage drop over my inductor, right? The potential difference between this point in the circuit and this point in the circuit can be expressed as the voltage drop over the capacitor or the combination of the voltage drop over the resistor plus the voltage drop over the inductor. So the result of my KCL, or excuse me, KVL equation, my apologies, is, Vc of t is equal to R3 times IL of t plus VL of t. And again, this isn't quite how I would like it, but I can express the voltage drop over my inductor in terms of my inductor current using the relationship L di by dt. And so that would give me Vc is equal to R3 IL of t plus L dil by dt. And let's call this so let's look at something real quick here. Okay. If I substitute equation two into equation one, this first term, VC of T over R2 could be expressed entirely in terms of IL and its derivative. Then I have C times the derivative of the voltage and then plus IL, right? So my leftmost term can be expressed entirely in terms of my uh, inductor current. My rightmost term is my inductor current. So if I can figure out some relationship to substitute here for the derivative of the voltage in terms of the inductor current, I will have a differential equation only in terms of my inductor current. So how are we going to get a relationship for the derivative of the capacitor voltage in terms of only the inductor current? Take the derivative of this guy, exactly right. So if we take the derivative, of equation two with respect to time, we would get the derivative of the capacitor current with respect to time is R3 times the derivative of the inductor current with respect to time plus L times second derivative of the inductor current 
with respect to time. Let's call this guy. So taking that derivative term there is what's going to give us our second order differential equation because prior to that point, we didn't have a second derivative anywhere in our system. Okay. So that's an absolutely necessary step. It is very often, I don't want to say 100% of the time because I don't know that there's any way to prove that, but it is very often that you will wind up having to take the derivative of one of your equations in order to get your second order relationship. All right, so now we are simply going to substitute equations two and three into equation one, and we'll be good to go. Notice, however, just for the sake of argument here, if I had taken this guy right here and moved IL to the other side of the equal sign, I could take the derivative of it and get something related to the second derivative of my capacitor voltage, which I could then substitute into my KVL equation, and I'd wind up getting a second order differential equation in terms of BC as opposed to I. Literally going to be the exact same relationship whichever way we go. I'm choosing to put two and three into one instead of taking the derivative of one and placing that and one into two. We would literally get the exact same relationship. All right, so at this point, it's just algebra. It's annoying amount of algebra, but it is algebra. Connor. Okay. So if we substitute three, two and three into one, we're gonna have a factor of one over R2 multiplied by R3 times IL plus L times the derivative of IL plus C times, now we're substituting in uh, equation three. So C R3 the derivative of IL plus L times the second derivative of IL plus IL is equal to zero. Are we okay with these substitutions? So now we just need to organize. Right. So let's start with the second derivative term. I have C multiplied by L multiplied by the second derivative. So that's going to look like L C And for bookkeeping purposes, I'm going to put a check mark by that to mean that I've taken that part into account. That's the only second derivative term we're going to have, so I'm good there. For our first derivative term, well, I have an L over R2 and a C times R3. And to be clear here, that's taking care of this guy and this guy. And then for my zeroth derivative term or the inductor current by itself, I have a factor of one coming from the right hand most term 
a factor of R3 over R2 coming from the leftmost term. So that's going to give me 1 plus R3 over R2 times IL of T is equal to 0. The last thing I need to do here is to divide both sides of the equation by LC, right? And that's because I need my coefficient for the second derivative term to be one. So that would give me second derivative plus L over R2 plus R3C, this whole thing over LC times the first derivative plus one plus R3 over R2 divided by this whole thing times the zero derivative is equal to zero. And thus alpha is L over R2 plus R3C divided by LC, excuse me, twice LC and omega naught is gonna be the square root of one plus R3 over R2 divided by LC. So to be clear, all I did to get from this step here, where we have our second order differential equation and the coefficient of the second derivative term is one, to here, where I am defining alpha and omega naught in terms of our circuit parameters, as I simply took the coefficient of the first derivative term and divided it by a factor of two, which gives me alpha. And I took the coefficient of the zero as derivative term and took the square root of it, which gives me omega naught. I chose to work this problem symbolically first before we bother even introducing any numbers to anything because it is my very strong opinion that you're much more likely to make a mistake in this if you actually include numbers right out of the gate. So even if I give you a circuit where everything, all of the resistors are expressed as some number of ohms, all of the inductors are expressed as some number of Henry's and all of the capacitors are expressed as some number of farads. I would highly, highly encourage you to just label things R1, R2, R3, L1, L2, et cetera, C1, C2, et cetera, and then do the math symbolically first and then put the numbers in at the end. You're much less likely to make a mistake in my experience of having taught this class for five years at this point. All right, so how did that level of math feel? Not particularly difficult, in my opinion. Um, this, this circuit was a simple-ish version. Um, it can definitely get more difficult, but can actually get more simple as well. I'm not going to give you guys anything uh, related to this concept of general RLC circuits or what we're going to cover on Friday, general um, second order circuits on your in-class portion of your exam at all, just because of how tedious it can be at times to come up with this second order differential equation. Effectively, I don't want to waste half of your test for you to be able to start a problem. Your take-home test will only be this. <laughs>
it will be exactly one problem involving a what I believe to be a medium to difficult general RLC search. Your upcoming test on Monday, effectively, the material for that stopped last Wednesday. Connor. Check. Check. Thank you. How did the first derivative and zero derivative terms get divided by LC? I divided both sides by LC. Because I have a zero on the right hand side, zero over LC is still just zero. So the goal here is to get a second order differential where the coefficient of the second derivative term is one. And to facilitate that, I had to divide both sides by LC. Now, just as a shit. Oh, wait, I just made the chat thing too large. Did I close out Zoom? No. Okay, good. Sorry. The reason why the right hand term here is zero is because our switch took out our independent source on the left hand side, right? If we were adding in any sort of independent source to our circuit, or, or, or if any independent sources were left in um, during the transient condition, we would find that the constant term would not be zero, but it does not in any way, shape, or form change literally anything. We'd still be looking for a second order differential equation where the coefficient of the first, uh, excuse me, the coefficient of the second derivative term is one. Um, alpha would still be the coefficient of the first derivative term multiplied by a factor of one half. Omega naught would still be the coefficient of the zero derivative term taking the square root of it would change literally nothing else except that we wouldn't have these convenient zeros all over the place. Everything else is exactly the same, including the determination of alpha and omega naught. So at this point, once we have numbers, we can calculate alpha, calculate omega naught, tell if the circuit is a underdamp circuit, overdamp circuit, or critically damp circuit, and then treat it as if it were the exact same thing as every problem we've worked up to this point. The only change is we don't have a generic equation that tells us what alpha and omega naught are. Everything past this setup point is literally identical to what you have done previously. Okay? So, there's a lot of arguably annoying math that goes into this. So, let's go ahead and put some numbers in and verify that our simulation matches our analytical solution. Are you just going to ask you to submit that and then you're going to check for everything? Exactly right. So, the only thing that we don't get to use off of that table is alpha and omega naught. Everything else is still valid. Yes. Good question. All right. So let's put some numbers in. Um, the value, well, I guess the value of our current source is going to matter. So let's call this a three amp source. Let's call this a two ohm resistor, a four ohm resistor. 10 ohm resistor, a two Henry inductor, and a one half millifarad capacitor. Okay. We're now just going to plug those values in, calculate alpha and omega naught. I Apparently left my calculator upstairs, so I'm going to either borrow one or rely on you guys to do the math. Thank you, guys. 
All right. So using these values, so let's see, we're going to have L over R2. So that's 2 over 4 plus R3, which was 10 times C, which was 0 0.5 times 10 to the minus 3 divided by LC. So that's 2 times 0 0.5 times 10 to the minus 3. I get alpha. Actually, I take that back because I forgot to include the second two down there. So I got alpha to be 252.5 using the numbers that we have defined up top here. If anybody got something different from that, please let me know because there's always a possibility of mistakes, especially when I make up numbers on the spot. For omega naught, I have the square root of 1 plus R3. So that's 1 plus 10 over R2, which was 4, divided by L, which was 2, times C, which was 0 0.5 times 10 to the minus 3. And I get 59.161 for omega naught. Okay. So I got these numbers, Tyler got these numbers. Anybody have any opposition to us moving forward with the assumption that these numbers are correct? All right, so since alpha is greater than omega naught, this circuit is an example of a overdamped circuit. So while we are at this, we need to go ahead and calculate S1 and S2 based on these values. So S1 is always negative alpha plus the square root of alpha squared minus omega naught squared. which I get to be negative 7.028 per second. Uh, sorry, uh, let me go back to answer this question in the chat here that I didn't see earlier. So we always analyze our equation during the transit condition. That is absolutely correct. The whole point of this thing, can I make this smaller? Yes. Um, is that the differential equation that we develop has to be during the transient condition because that's when the equation, the response equations are valid, right? At DC steady state, so before our switch changes state, it's a DC circuit. A very long time after our transient conditions have died out, it's a DC circuit. Only during the transient condition do the capacitor and inductors not behave like their DC steady state equivalents. All right. S2 is always negative alpha minus the square root of alpha squared minus omega naught squared. And so for that number, I get negative 497.97. One per second. And just as a reminder, I've stored this number as A in my calculator, and I've stored this number as B 
in, uh, I say my calculator, Catherine's calculator, because she was nice enough to let me borrow one. All right, so at this point, we know that the circuit is an overdamp circuit. We have S1, we have S2. Now, I guess we need to decide which of the multiple quantities that we could be looking for are we actually looking for here. Uh, I, I'm going to say let's look for the capacitor current because I don't think that we've done one looking for that specifically yet. Bradley. So if we use our inductor current to find our alpha and omega, we also have to use one of the comparators and find the very good question, and the answer is no. We would get literally the exact same differential, uh, second order differential equation, um, and the, and therefore the exact same coefficients had we found everything in terms of the capacitor voltage or the inductor current. So one or the other works to calculate alpha and omega naught, and you'll get the exact same answers either way. So you don't need to develop two different second order differential equations. If you can do it once, you're good to go with all of the subsequent steps. It's a very good question. All right, so from here, we need to analyze our circuit at T is equal to zero minus. So at T is equal to zero minus, the resistor R2 is effectively just open circuited. Um, so I'm going to choose not to draw it to make things slightly more simplified. So we're going to have IS in parallel with resistor R1. In parallel with our capacitor. So this is going to be VC at zero minus. Here is our resistor R3. Uh, actually, I should probably put numbers here. Can somebody remind me of what numbers I arbitrarily chose? All right. So since the capacitor is going to look like an open circuit and the inductor is going to look like a short circuit, I don't need their values. R3 was 10 ohms though, right? All right. Okay, so I believe that this is what our circuit looks like at T is equal to zero minus. And just for the sake of argument, here is IL at zero minus. Um, just to be thorough, here's VL at zero minus. Here's IC at zero minus. And let's go ahead and determine all four of these quantities for all points. Because that's how I usually ask you to do it anyway. So we should be able to answer literally all of these questions. Um, well, not all of them. IL at zero minus can't be answered by inspection, but the others can. So, like, what is actually that's not true. We can't do VC uh, by inspection. Either. All right. So let's start with the ones that we know what the answer is going to be. Uh, the voltage drop over our inductor at zero minus is always going to be zero volts. And the current flowing through our capacitor at zero minus is always going to be zero amps, right? So VC of zero minus, we're going to have to do some work for. IC for zero minus has to be zero amps. VL at zero minus has to be zero volts. IL at zero minus, we're going to have to do some work for. So let's talk about the two quantities that we can't figure out just by looking at them. Anybody have any thoughts as to how we might approach this? Right. Okay. 
So the voltage drop across the capacitor is the same as the voltage drop over the 10 ohm resistor and the 2 ohm resistor because the 2 ohm resistor and the 10 ohm resistor are in parallel. So we can absolutely use Ohm's law as was suggested, but we have to recognize the 2 ohm resistor and the 10 ohm resistor are in parallel. Otherwise, we're going to get an erroneous result. Another means, uh, which I believe was suggested, was that we could do current division to find out the current flowing through the inductor, which is the current flowing through the 10 ohm resistor, and then simply use Ohm's law 10 times IL of 0 naught will also get us BC. Either of those two things work because they're effectively the exact same thing, just doing the steps in the opposite order. So uh, what would you prefer? Ohm's law and then Okay, current division. All right, so let's do current division. Then. So IL at zero minus is going to be three amps times one tenth of an ohm divided by, or excuse me, one over 10 ohms divided by one over two ohms plus one over 10 ohms. Which I get to be one half of an amp. So if the inductor current is one half of an amp, the voltage VC at zero minus is five volts because VC is just the voltage drop over the 10 ohm resistor. Do we feel comfortable with our analysis here at C is equal to zero minus? Seems reasonable to me. So are we good to move along to what's going on at T is equal to zero plus? Sure. So at T is equal to zero plus, we have our three amp source in parallel with our two ohm resistor. And then over here, we have a four ohm resistor in parallel with our capacitor. And then we have our 10 ohm resistor that is in series with our inductor. So we are gonna replace the inductor with a current source having the same direction and magnitude is IL at zero minus. So this is gonna be 0 0.5 amps. And we are gonna replace our capacitor with a voltage source having the same polarity and magnitude as VC at zero minus, which would make this five volts. And we need to determine IC at zero plus. and VL at zero plus. Anyone have any thoughts? In my opinion, superposition is too much work. It's, we could do it that way, but it's, it's a little too much work. And so what I mean by that is, what's the voltage drop over the 10 ohm resistor, positive polarity on the left? Right. So we, if we did KVL around the right-hand side, we would have negative five volts plus five volts plus VL is equal to zero, which means VL is zero, All right? So KVL around the right-hand side tells us, uh, so let's see, let's write things down here. So VC at zero plus is five volts because it cannot change abruptly. IC at zero plus we have yet to determine. L at zero plus we found to be zero volts by doing Kirchhoff's voltage law around the right hand loop. And IL at zero plus must be half an amp because it cannot change abruptly. 
All right, so we figured out VL by doing KVL. I would argue that we could figure out um, IC by doing KCL, right? So the current flowing to the left through the four ohm resistor is five volts over four ohms or 1.25 amps. The current flowing to the right is half an amp, right? And then the current flowing down is the thing we don't know. We add all three of those terms together and they must equal to zero. So that is 1.25 plus 0.5, which is 1.75 plus IC is equal to zero. IC has to be negative 1.75. That makes sense. Now, we could use an overkill, use mesh analysis, superposition, all those things, but my default setting is to look for a KCL, KVL, or Ohm's law relationship first, and then go to more advanced circuit techniques. So that's why. I'm so comfortable saying, well, let's just do KVL around this bit, and let's just do KCL there, and we'll get our answer. I practice those two things a lot because that's my default settings. So, anyway, are we satisfied with these numbers? Anything seems suspect? Bradley? Can we just run through IC first? Okay. So if we apply Kirchhoff's current law at this top middle node here, the current flowing to the left. That's five volts over four ohms, or 1.25 amps. The current flowing to the right is half an amp. The current flowing up is the sum of those two, because current flowing in has to equal current flowing out. IC is just the opposite of the current flowing up. So we don't act as a five volts over four ohms? We do not, because our yeah, so we're doing Kirchhoff's current law, and the five volts over the 10 ohms is this half amp anyway, because the only reason that we get to say it's just five volts over 10 ohms is because we know that there's no voltage drop across this. Right? So the half amp is the five volts over Right. We know that the current flowing through the 10 ohm resistor has to be half an amp because there's a half an amp source forcing it to be that. All right, so our analysis that T is equal to zero minus is done. I believe our analysis that T is equal to zero plus is done. Do we have to analyze the circuit at T is equal to infinity? Exactly right. There are no independent sources left in the circuit, so there's no need for us to do any analysis that T is equal to zero plus. So we can now move on to our response equation bit. So uh, I believe I said we're going to solve for the capacitor current. In order to solve for the capacitor current, our first equation needs to be our capacitor voltage relationship. So VC of T will be of the form A1E to the S1T plus A2E to the S2T. Well, we know that VC, oh, excuse me, uh, so VC at zero is simply A1 plus A2. VC at zero was five volts. So we have five volts is equal to A1 plus A2. That's our first equation in our system. Are we okay with that? All right, our second equation, IC of T is C dV by dT, or C times S1 A1 E to the S1 T plus S2 A2 E to the S2 T, IC at zero, plus specifically reduces to C multiplied by S1 A1 plus 
S2, A2. And so from this, um, let's see, IC at zero plus was negative 1.75 amps divided by 0 0.5 millifarads is equal to S1 times A1 plus S2 times A2. And since I stored S1 and S2 in my calculator, this is good enough for me to set up my system. So, the coefficients of my first equation, I get one A1, one A2, constant value of five. My coefficients for my second equation is A times A1, B times A2, let me just verify. Yes, okay. Is equal to negative 1.75 divided by 0 0.5 times 10 to the minus three. And solving, I get A1 is negative 2.5. 057 volts and A2 is positive 7.057. Anybody else able to get those numbers? You got different numbers, okay? So always a possibility that I type something in poorly. So let's redo it. Second system solve. All right, so my coefficient for A1 in my first equation was positive one. My coefficient for A2 in my first equation is also positive one. And my constant term was five. My coefficient for A1 in my second equation is negative 7.028. My coefficient for A2 in my second equation is negative 497.971. And then my constant term is negative 1.75 divided by 0 0.0005, which is negative 3,500. which is not correct. So, okay, no, it's not un unreasonable to double check these things at all, because I know for a fact that I make mistakes. So, yeah, not, not remotely unreasonable. Okay, so with this value for A1 and this value for A2, how do we determine the coefficients of our capacitor current? Well, I would argue that C times S1 times A1 is the first coefficient. C times S2 times A2 is our second coefficient, right? So C, which is 0 0.5 times 10 to the minus 3 times S1, which I have stored as 
variable a times a1, which I have stored as variable x, I get i e of t is 7.231 e to the minus negative 7.028 T. And then let's see, I have C, so that's 0 0.5 times 10 to the minus three times S2, which I have as B times A2, which I have stored as Y. Uh, so this bit is in milliamps. And then I get negative 1.757 e to the minus four hundred ninety-seven point nine seven one t And since we are effectively out of time here, what we'll do at the beginning of class on Friday is simulate this guy real quick to make sure that we're correct. Or if you guys want to do that and then tell me whether or not we got it correct, that way it's fine too. Whatever floats your boat's okay by me. Anywho, after we figured out what our second order differential equation was, our steps did not change at all as to how we approached any of these problems, right? So the annoying part of the general RLC circuits is finding that second order differential equation. Once we get good at that, we can approach any second order circuit. So any circuit containing two energy storage elements with ease. Uh, a question that some of you have asked in the past is, well, if we can do this for second order circuits, we can obviously do it for first order circuits because that's what we did back in circuit one. What about third and higher order circuits? And the short answer there is the math gets so terrifying that Laplace, uh, using the Laplace representation of the circuit makes it um, doable by hand, whereas doing it using these methods would be an absolute nightmare. So anything higher than a second order system, we wind up using a frequency domain representation and uh, what's called the unit step response to figure things out. What class will we learn about Laplace? Uh, so you'll learn about Laplace transformations in Math 245 and also in uh, ELEN 224, which will take in the fall, which apparently I'm teaching. Uh, and then you'll also uh, beat it to death in ELEN 324 one in the winter of next year, um, which is your uh, linear systems and signals course. Yep. Circuits three. Yes, that's your first junior class, although it is a sophomore number designation because it starts with a two. Yes. Uh, it'll be my first time ever teaching it this upcoming fall. So get ready to suffer. <laughs>